stuff. So I've been thinking about, all week, I, I, it's kind of weird, I've been thinking about basketball, which, which is strange because it's baseball season and I love baseball. And baseball is the most spiritual sport. We're not even going to debate that. But I've been thinking about basketball and, and really specifically thinking about many, many years ago now when I was a young college graduate and went and interviewed for my first teaching position, teaching second grade. And during the interview, the superintendent says, and oh, by the way, could you, could you coach basketball? And I had seen basketball. So I said, sure. I can coach basketball. And I was taller then, yes. I was much taller and better at basketball. And, and, and so I was, I was given junior high girls. I taught second grade and coached junior high girls. And it was great experience. And, you know, so we had two plays. We had two plays. One play to run if they were playing a, a man-to-man defense and another play to run if they were playing a zone defense. But we loved our, our zone defense play. If you just kind of picture this, I should have had a diagram. I should have, because I love diagramming. And I just remember this play that we would have three ball handlers, three guards, as it were, and two forwards. And the forwards would post up on the key underneath the basket, and the guards would be out in front. And, and the one guard on the side, well, the point guard right in the middle would pass the ball over to one of the guards on the side. And that guard would wait for one of the forwards to flash up and kind of out towards the, the sideline. And, and she would pass the ball to that forward and then cut through the middle of the key. And then after cutting through the middle of the key, set a screen for the other forward who would flash into the middle of the key and then back. And then it would all rotate and we'd do it again and again and again. And you know what? My sixth, or my seventh and eighth grade girls got really good at running that play. Except they had no idea why we were doing it. See, they, they were really good at passing the ball where they need to pass. And then to, to run through the key, and then it was probably maybe the end of the season, I realized they really have no idea why they're doing that. And so I had asked, so, so after you pass the ball and you run through the key, why are you doing that? And the answer was, because I have to go over there. And, and so why are you setting the screen? I don't know, that's just what you told me to do, so I set a screen. And, and why are you flashing? And the idea was you're going to the right places and you're doing the right things and you got the right sequence, but why? And it was really a revelation to realize that after I passed that ball and I cut through the screen, I could get the ball back. And if I get the ball back, I might have an opportunity to shoot a basket. It was mind-blowing. It was a revelation. They'd never considered that there was a reason for cutting through the, cutting through the middle of the key. And so when, when I told him that, I said, now when you go through, expect that you're going to get the ball back. So have your hands up. It's not just a picnic trip. Don't just run. Go through the key with your hands up. And if you don't get the ball, you're still accomplishing something. If you don't get a chance to shoot, you're still doing something. Because if you look like you're supposed to get the ball, the defense is going to have to move and adjust to you. And the more we do this, the more the defense has to move. And then we catch them out of position, and we have an easy chance to score. And by the way, that other forward that cuts through the middle, why are you doing that? It's not just a lovely little dance. You're cutting in the middle because you might be open. Get your hands up and understand where you're going. So, you know, it was an interesting revelation to say we're doing the right things, but we have to do the right things for a purpose, for a reason. Now you understand why I was thinking about this. Because often... I think that describes us as Christians, that we know the right things to do and we're doing the right things and we're, we're making the pass when we need to make the pass and we're cutting through the key when we need to cut through the key, but we do that without giving any thought to why am I doing that? Our theme for the year is living our life on purpose, living our life deliberately, that we're doing things not just because it's the right thing to do but because there's something specifically that we want to accomplish. So we've been looking at this. Open your Bibles to 2nd, I'm sorry, 1st Peter. 
this is our, our theme that we've really been developing and understanding that we are living our life on purpose. That there's something that we want to accomplish in the day-to-day -day routines. And we're not just going to go through our day-to-day -day routines without giving thought to what it is that needs to be and wants to be accomplished. So we're going to live our life on purpose. We're coming to realize, even in living our life on purpose, that we have to live differently. That if we're going to live out this purpose that we have before the Lord, we have to live differently. We've been called to be different. We've been set free from the enslavement of sin. We've been set free from that tyranny. We've been given a new operating system, a new mindset, a new priority, a, a, a new value. And so as those who have been set free, we can't live like those who are still enslaved to sin. We have to live our life on purpose, and if we're going to do that, we have to live our lives differently. Now, we've been developing that and opening up that up, and we realize that as we live our life differently, we've seen now Peter unfolding for us some really radical applications of living differently. Some applications that go counter to the world's culture. And we saw the first one of those, to, to honor the king, to honor those who are politically have authority over us. And we, we had a good time just understanding how radical that is to say to honor means to hold in highest regard. Do we hold in highest regard those who have authority over us? Not just those we agree with, but those that God has placed in authority over us. This is radical. It was radical for Peter. It's radical for us. And then he gave us the second example of a radical application of living differently. And that's the idea of submitting to those who have authority over us in our work. Submit, remember that word submit means to get in line behind. And if God has put somebody in authority over you in your work life, you need to get in line behind that because it's pleasing to God. That's radical. Radical to think that way. As we move on with that, we realize that as we submit, as we honor authorities, we can expect that there would be opposition. We can expect some pushback, and there are a couple reasons why we can expect pushback. In fact, um, Peter begins to touch on this at verse 19. Let me read, starting at verse 19, chapter 2, 1 Peter. Let's start at verse 18. He says, servants, be submissive to your masters. That's Submit to those who have authority over you in your work life. Servants, submit to your masters with all respect, not only those who are good and gentle, but also those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if, for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrow when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it, and you endure it with patience? But if... When you do what is right and suffer for it, you, you patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. You've been called for this purpose. Now, we're going to fold that for a minute. But even at verse 19, Peter begins to hint again, as he has earlier in his letter, as he will unfold more fully later in his letter, as we live differently, there's going to be pushback. There's going to be opposition. We just anticipate that and anticipate that for a couple reasons. And, and one is this is counterculture. When we live this way, it's weird in the culture. And the culture says, we don't like it. And they're going to push back just to be counterculture. But then we understand the bigger picture behind the scene, that there is a spiritual battle going on. And when we live our lives in response to who God is, there is a spiritual battle and there is a spiritual push back. So we can expect that there is opposition. Peter says, this finds favor before God. Now, it's not the suffering that finds favor before God because God doesn't delight in your suffering. God is not a cruel God. He's not a malicious God who just kind of likes it when we suffer and we're uneasy. That's not who God is. But you know what he delights in? He delights that in your suffering, when you suffer, you endure that and, and you don't respond with that selfishness. You don't respond with the same raging as the world. He delights when your response to suffering is a reflection of who he is. When you love him and your desire is to please him, 
and, and that desire overshadows everything else. Your desire to please him is greater than your desire to get even or your desire to be comfortable or your desire to follow out and carry out your own, your own plan. That's what delights the heart of God. Now, that's all part of the introduction here because in that reality of suffering, there's a promise. But the promise has a condition. Let's pick this up here. We can anticipate that they're suffering. Verse 19. For, for this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God a person bears up under sorrow when suffering unjustly. When, when, you, when you're up against it, when you're suffering unjustly and you bear that, it finds favor. Now, we don't see it specifically here, but as we unfold all of Scripture... There are great promises. In fact, the Beatitudes, blessed are you when people persecute you. You know that word, that blessed? That's a good position. That's really how we should interpret that. You're in a really good place if you're persecuted for the name of Christ. There's blessing there. This finds favor with God. And, and we just take, take it to, un, to mean this. We understand it this way, that God takes notice. God notices his children. And he doesn't delight in their suffering, but he does delight when they endure that and they bring glory to his name. And there's return for that. There is blessing for that. So there's a promise, but the promise comes with conditions. Did you see him here? Here's the conditions. Go back to verse 19. But this finds favor if, for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrow when suffering unjustly. Here's the condition. For what credit is there if... When you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. Here's the first condition. You're suffering for the right reasons. There's blessing for the believer who suffers if they're suffering for the right reasons. Now, we really frame that, and we kind of touched on it last week, frame that in the context of your work life, those who have authority over you in your work life. And if you're doing everything you need to do and your employer is harsh, but you keep going, that finds favor with God. But don't expect any spiritual return. There's no spiritual credit if you are somebody who does evil and you're treated harshly and you bear it. It doesn't work. So we'll put that in the context of employee. If you're a rotten employee and the boss is all over you, there's no spiritual credit for that. Sorry about that. If you're lazy, if you're unreliable, if you come in late, if you steal from your employer and, and you're harshly treated because of it, there's no return for that. There's no spiritual credit for that. See, and, and we could frame it this way. I like this statement. There's a big difference between suffering for the cause and the name of Christ and, here's the, the counter to that, suffering as an evildoer who names the name of Christ understand that? There's a big difference between suffering for the cause and the name of Christ and suffering as an evildoer who just happens to name the name of Christ. You know, I think there are people around us who do that, that they are, they are lawbreakers, they are evildoers, and then they, they get called on it. They're, there's pushback, and they say, yeah, but I'm a Christian. And then they expect that there's some return for that. God says there's no return for that. The, the blessing comes when you do what is right and suffer for it, not when you do what is wrong and suffer for it. And then here's the other part of that blessing. Here's the other part of the condition, that you suffer and you endure it the right way. And this comes back to what we were saying all along, that we have to live differently. Our response is not the same response as the world around us. We endure it the right way and not, not raging as the world rages. When we're mistreated, we don't demand our right to be angry and we don't demand our right to hate and we don't demand our right to retaliate. That we apply a different standard. And we talked about that last week. That different standard is a divine response. It's a divine standard. But it's interesting that in verse 21, in the context of all that, we're told that you've been called for this. For, for you have been called for this 
purpose. Now, what purpose is that? We've been called for a purpose. This is what God has had in mind for you from the very beginning. When he decided that he was going to send his own son to save you. When he called you to relationship with himself. When you embraced Jesus as Savior. This was all part of God's design. You were called for a purpose. What was the purpose? Not to suffer. See, God doesn't delight in suffering. He doesn't delight in the, the cruel treatment of his children. He doesn't even delight that, that you are pressed against that. Now, as we say that, understand God's not all that concerned with your comfort and ease and certainly not concerned with your luxury because he's about something. He's about shaping you into the image of his son. And you know what the purpose is? The purpose is that you would live your life in such a way that others come to that saving knowledge of Christ, that Christ is seen as real in you, that you live your life in such a way that others come to that knowledge of Christ and that God is glorified. That's the purpose. That's the purpose. In fact, we saw that a little earlier in this very chapter. That we do these things, we live this way, so that perhaps the others, as they observe them, might glorify God in the day of visitation. I, I just believe that that points to the fact that when Jesus comes, they're going to be able to glorify him and praise him because they saw your life. They saw that Jesus was real in you and they embraced that same Savior. That's the purpose. So, in that purpose, you've been called for this purpose. In that purpose, Peter goes on to say, you've been given an example to follow. Verse 21. If you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. What is that example? Well, the example is that divine response. The example is the divine response. We say, well, of course, he, he gave the divine response because he's Jesus. He was God. But, but understand what he did here. Remember what the divine response is. There are levels of response. That one level, first level, is the demonic response. When somebody does good to you, you return evil. That's of the devil. Unfortunately, we see that. We see that around us. We see those who are returning evil for good. That's, that's, of, that's of the enemy. Most of us operate on the human response, the human level. I love those who love me. I oppose those who oppose me. If you do good to me, I will do good to you. If you do wrong to me, then I'm going to do wrong to you. That's the human response. That's the way we operate. That's the way our world operates. But you know what? We've been called to a higher response, a different response, and that different response is the divine response. And the divine response is this. When you do evil to me, I'm going to return it with good to you. And Jesus demonstrated that divine response. He didn't respond with, uh, or we would say he didn't respond in kind. L look at how Peter unfolds this here. Verse 22. Now we've got to back up to verse 21. For you were called for this very purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in him. And while he was being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. First of all, Peter just spells it out again. When he was suffering, when he was suffering, and, and we just take note of this fact that um, he's the one who committed no sin. There wasn't any deceit found in him. There wasn't any reason for him to suffer. Certainly, he didn't suffer as one who was a doer of evil. Now, there, that's great theological truth there, an important theological truth, that it was the just who suffered in the place of the unjust. The one who committed no sin took our punishment upon himself. If he had committed sin himself, if he was worthy of punishment himself, then he wouldn't have been qualified to pay our debt. He would have been paying his own debt. But it was the just for the unjust, and his suffering was real. But notice again how Peter lines this out. How did he respond to that? Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. Take a look at those words for a minute. Reviled. Um, 
the word, I, I, I like the, uh, just the definition, abusive insults. That he endured those abusive insults. And we can go back in our understanding of the gospel and just picture that. His arrest, his trial, the mistreatment by the guards, being nailed to the cross, hanging on the cross all the time, being insulted, those abusive insults that would cut to our heart that he endured all that, and he didn't revile in return. Now, see, the human response, the human response would be, okay, you insult me, I'm, I'm going to give it right back to you. You're going to insult me? Yeah, but you are the ones. You just don't know. You're, you're the rotten, dirty sinners. Could have done that, but he didn't do that. Even more, when he was suffering, he uttered no threats. This word suffering, it, it's, it really has that picture of intense agony. While he was in intense agony, he didn't respond with threats. And we just unfold that and understand the intense agony was, it was physical agony, it was emotional agony, it was spiritual agony. He's suffering. And we could understand on that human level, if he responded with the human response to utter those threats, those who were mistreating him, those who were nailing him to the cross, that he could have said, and just imagine what he could have threatened to say, yeah, but you're going to get yours. One day, yeah, you nail me to the cross now, but one day you're going to get yours. One day I'm coming back. One day there's going to be judgment. You're going to get yours. Could have. But he didn't. He didn't utter any threats, Peter said. He didn't respond in kind. He responded differently. The divine response. Because he was about producing and accomplishing something good. As he did that, we have an example here of his uh, example of the divine hope. He didn't respond in kind. And while, verse 23, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. But he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. He kept in trusting himself. Now, that little word, that little phrase, that's really important. For one thing, it just kind of puts us in mind of the intensity right here. The intensity of the cross, the intensity of this situation. That he kept entrusting himself, because that word kept, that phrase kept entrusting himself, it's not just a one-time action with a continuing result. As if, yeah, and while he was at the cross, he said, okay, God, you take care of me, and that settled it, and then God just took care of him. It's the idea that it's a continual action, that he kept on entrusting himself. We know how that works, that he gave that situation over to, to the Lord, and he gave it over to the Lord, and he gave it over to the Lord, and he gave it over to the Lord. That moment by moment, it had to be that purposeful decision to say, but I'm in the hands of God. It really speaks of the reality and the turmoil of the cross. And here's the big idea. Here's what I want you to grab a hold of here. See, this idea of living differently really is a matter of trusting the one who called us. He was able to go to the cross. He was able to endure the suffering, to be reviled without reviling in return, to suffer without uttering threats, because he trusted God. He kept entrusting himself to the one who had called him, to the one who had laid out this plan of salvation. By the way, this, this word um, entrusting, it means to hand over. He kept handing himself over. In different contexts, we could translate this word to be betrayed. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he handed Jesus over to the authorities. Same word, same idea. Jesus kept handing himself over to the one who was able to judge. That's how we do that. That's how we live differently in a world that is going to push back. That's how we live differently in the world that is not going to love you and will probably persecute you. How do we live differently and respond with that divine response as opposed to responding in kind? When they insult me, I'm going to insult them. 
when they rage against me, I'm going to rage against them. How do we respond with a divine response? Well, we have to keep on entrusting ourselves to the one who called us. To entrust yourself, you have to remind yourself of what is true. Let's give me, let me give you these very quickly. We have to go back and remind ourselves, and this has to be an ongoing process. Hour by hour, moment by moment, when we're entrusting God, we have to remind ourselves of what is true of the one that I trust. If I'm going to hand my con condition over to him, my circumstance, my, my suffering, my pain, I have to remind myself what's true of the one I'm handing off to. So we, we look at those great theological things. We know that God is always, ever present. He's always present. What's the theological word? Omnipresent. That's right. Why is that important? So just think about this. If God is always ever present, then he knows what my circumstance is. I, I like to say it this way. Does God know where you are? Does he? So, so you're hurting and suffering and your life is a mess and it's falling apart. D does God know where you are? Yeah. And, and where is God? Well, he's right there with you. He's right there with you in that mess, in that circumstance. If God is always ever present, then he, he knows. And the amazing thing is, well, we'll unfold this in a minute. Here's number two thing. He's always ever present, but also God has all knowledge. Not only is he with you in the suffering, he has all knowledge. What's the theological word we use? Omniscient, right. He has all knowledge. It's just amazing that we can't inform God of anything. We can't. And, and just think about that when we come to prayer. So God, um, you may not be aware. Let me just let fill you in on what's going on down here. Wrong concept, isn't it? He is aware. He doesn't need to be filled in on what's going on down here because he's always ever present here, and he has all knowledge. But what does that mean in our suffering? When the world is pushing against us, when it's pushing back, when it's reviling, when it's hating, when it's persecuting. Well, he has all knowledge. So, first of all, he knows what he wants to accomplish in this. He knows how he wants to use this, how he wants to turn your suffering into glory. And he has all knowledge, so he knows how to deliver. But he also knows when to deliver. Now, we like to inform God. We like to let him know what our plans are and when he should act and how he should act. Maybe that's just a natural response of a hurting heart. But when we come back and we entrust ourselves to him, we remind ourselves that he already has all knowledge. He knows what he's going to do, what he wants to do, and he knows how to do it. And then we remind ourselves of a third thing, that God is righteous and he is good. Now, this is the one that I think is really important, for me anyway. That God is good. So what he purposes to do is good. Whether or not I understand it. When my life is in turmoil and I say, God, do you know what's going on here? And do you know what's happening? And how come you haven't delivered me? I, I can come back to the, that foundational thought that he's good. He's righteous. What he does is always right. And what he does is always good. And so he's going to act. He's going to work. He's going to do what is good. He knows what he wants to accomplish. And he cares. Because he's righteous and he's good. He cares about us. You know, that, that phrase, God really is for you. He's not concerned with your ease and your comfort and your luxury. But he is for you. And he loves you. And he cares for you. And he is good. And he doesn't the light in your ruin. He's not a capricious God. So, we start building these up. He's always ever present. He has all knowledge. He is, he is good and righteous. And then we realize he's all powerful. That God has all powerful. What all power? What's the theological word? Thank you. Omnipotence. Is omnipotence. He has all power. So we put all those together. What's that mean? That God knows where I am. He's always ever present. He's never going to leave me or abandon me. He, he's not 
distant when I'm going through these struggles. He has all knowledge. He knows what he wants to accomplish. He's good and he's loving. And what he's going to do is going to be good and it's going to be perfect. And he has the power to do it. See, none of that would really make much sense if he were a limited God, a powerless God. He's got the power to do that, to do what is good in my life. And maybe we should add a fifth one here. I didn't give you a fifth line on your nose, but he's immutable, which means he doesn't change. So it's always going to be that way. And when we keep those things in mind, then we can entrust ourselves to the one who is good, who is for you who's got a purpose and a plan, and he knows what that is, and he knows how to accomplish it, and he's got the power to accomplish it. And so when our life is in a mess, and it's in turmoil, and it hurts, we say, but God, I just trust you. By the way, the rest of this is, uh, is the example of Jesus' divine response, and it's the gospel. The rest of the chapter is the divine response, and it could be boiled down at, as the gospel. We have to look at it very quickly. Verse 23, and while he was being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself, here's the divine response, he himself bore our sin in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we are healed. For we were continually straying like sheep, but now have, have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of our soul. We didn't deserve that. It's the gospel. Just very simply lined out. And the gospel is this, that he bore our sin. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God, that our sin, our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, our condemnation was all placed on him as he went to the cross. Now that idea of suffering becomes even more real. And he bore it to the cross for us, the just for the unjust, the, the innocent for the guilty, taking our guilt, taking our shame, taking the just penalty for our rebellion, and he took it to the cross. And you know what he gave us in return? He gave us life. Peter says that we might die to sin. Another way of saying just what he's been unfolding all along, that we're no longer slaves to sin. Sin doesn't hold us. It's not our master anymore. We're not under the condemnation of death anymore. He broke its hold on us, paying that penalty. And not only did he pay the penalty, but he restored us. I love that phrase. By his wounds we are healed. Now, the picture here, I, I think the picture that, that Peter is giving to us, really it's, it's this physical health. It's about sickness. It's about disease. It's about cancer. That's, that's the picture, the analogy he uses. That by his wounds, the cancer of sin is removed. By his wounds, that sickness that sin produced in us is removed. And we are restored to, not just unsick, we're restored to health. We are restored to a right relationship with the Heavenly Father. And it's all because Jesus responded, not on that human level, reviling for reviling, insult for insult, threatening for suffering, but he endured that so that something better could be accomplished, and that something better is your salvation. That's the response. That's the example we have. So what do we do with that? A couple things that we do with that. Number one, if you've never embraced that, if you've never known that salvation, if you've never cried out and said, oh God, let that death count for me. Let that shed blood be the sufficient payment of my sin. Take my guilt. Take my shame. Take my unworthiness. And give me your righteousness. If you've never done that, this would be a good day. I'd love to pray with you to show you how you can know the Savior. If you have, then you need to follow that example of a divine response. We can't live the same way the world lives. We can't respond good for good, evil for evil, because that's the way those who are still enslaved to sin do it. We have to respond different. We have to live our lives on purpose. And this is the purpose that you were called to, 
that you would live so much differently that the world would see that and could not deny the reality of Christ in you. And as they see, as they see Christ in you, that they would come to that place of embracing that same Savior. And so when that righteous judge comes, they'll be able to glorify him and praise him because they saw Christ in you. Amen. Father, this day.